I never was much of a talker. I came by it honest, neither was my daddy. Well, he, uh, he got his mouth shut one time by a big old angel. I reckon that tend to make a fella careful. I got old enough, I left. I went out in the desert so I could think about it all. You know, the, the, morning, the morning I left, my daddy, he, uh, he walked me down to the river. He handed me this note. He said these were some of the words he said over me when I was a baby when he got his voice back. He told me to chew on him. You, my boy, are going to go ahead of the Lord and get everybody ready for him. You're going to tell him that they can have their sins forgiven. Tell him that God's kindness is going to shine on them like the rising sun. I did it. I, 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 I chewed on them, these words, for a long time. And then these words, they started chewing on me. Now, I felt this, uh, this weight on me. So I, I went back to the river, and, and I opened up my mouth, and, and the words just started pouring out of them like a swarm of bees. I, I heard myself fussing at the religious people and, and telling everybody to get straight with God and get baptized. i tell you the truth, I wasn't even sure what I was saying, but I just kept talking, talking and, and baptizing all the time with that weight on me. And then one morning, I, I look up, and there's this fella. He's walking toward me, and, and I, I heard myself saying, real quiet, almost under my breath, there he is. <laughs> That's the Lamb of God. He's going to take away all our sins. He walked right up to me. I saw then it was my cousin, it was Jesus. I hadn't seen him in years. He told me to baptize him. I did it. And we're standing next to each other in the river, and he's dripping wet. And I swear, I heard this voice like it's coming out the clouds saying, that's my boy. And I am pleased with him. <laughs> Isn't that something? I could not take my eyes off of him. He was shining. He's shining, I'll tell you, like the, like the rising sun. And I felt that weight go off of me then because I knew I had done my job. I had, I had gone ahead of him. None of this was about me. Well, it never was. It was all about him. Well, still is. How's everybody today? Good? We are continuing our series through the book of Luke, and today we find ourselves at Luke in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and this is the story of John the Baptist. Um, and John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. You guys realize that. And I, I was thinking about cousins and, and the types of cousins sometimes that we grow up with. Anybody have kind of a fearless, wild, and crazy cousin? Anybody have one of those? Okay, uh, just somebody who's absolutely fearless, just do anything, try anything. Uh, he's just one of these people who's notorious for phrases like, y'all watch this. You know, that kind of cousin. You ever had one of those? I was, when I was growing up, I had an older cousin. He was about three or four years older than me. He was my dad's uh, brother, Billy's son. His name is Tony. And Tony was the one that got me interested in football in the very beginning. We used to go to watch his football games when he played uh, Pop Warner football or youth league football. And, and he was really a great player. He was a defensive player. He kind of was one of those guys who kind of played like his hair was on fire. He'd hit anybody at any time in any moment. Uh, just kind of mean and, 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 and fearless. And he just kind of had that attitude. And I remember watching him as a young boy. I said, man, I can't wait till I get a chance to play football. And he was kind of the one that, that kind of ignited a spark in me to, to go play that sport and enjoy that sport. And then not long after that, he moved away because his dad got a job in Columbia, South Carolina, and they moved from Louisville where we live to Columbia. And I spent a lot of years without seeing my cousin Tony. But I always remembered he was kind of fearless. He was kind of crazy. He was one of those guys. One vacation, we decided to load our family up and go to see my Uncle Billy's family in Columbia, South Carolina. And when we got there, it was in the middle of summertime, and we got there. It was hot, 
And we, we immediately went in the house, we put our swimsuits on, and we went out back to, to swim in their pool. Now, they had a big, I don't know, four foot, four and a half foot above ground pool out the back of their house. And uh, we got out there, we're excited to go swimming. I still hadn't spotted my cousin Tony, and I was wondering just where he might be. And so we get outside, and, and, and we're looking all around. We're getting ready to swim. My uncle had already said, Tony's out there. He'll, he's going to swim with you guys. And I was excited to see him. He's kind of a hero to me. And I'm looking all over, and I'm, finally I just start calling, Tony, where are you? And I hear a voice from above me. He goes, I'm up here, y'all. So we look up there, and there's my cousin Tony in his swim shorts and a pair of flip-flops, and he's on top of the house, on top of the house. And below where he's at on top of the house is a trampoline. And so he goes, y'all watch this. And he takes off running down the house. He hits, he hits the, the trampoline, jumps into the air over the rise of the, of the above-ground pool, does a peanut dive, a head-first peanut dive into the pool, and that was his way of welcoming us to his home. Uh, he was just that kind of person. He's just fearless, kind of crazy, just might do anything. You never know. You can't put anything past him. He, he's just somebody that, that, that um, lived life that way, kind of in a reckless way. When I think about John the Baptist, I think that he's Jesus's kind of crazy, fearless cousin, right? He has no fear of anything. He's not... He's not intimidated by the authorities in, in the world, the, the people that, that are, are wicked and, 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 and corrupt. And he, he knows that they could, they could really punish him for the things that he's saying. He's not afraid of them. He's not afraid of the religious leaders. He's not afraid of the people who don't like his message. He's just completely fearless, kind of reckless, a little bit crazy. Um, he had taken a Nazarite vow as a, as a child. His dad had had told him that the angel had told him to take a Nazarite vow, which means that he couldn't drink any strong drink. He couldn't cut his hair and he couldn't touch a dead animal or any kind of carcass. And so he had come up a little different. I think he was one of these guys that just kind of embraced that he was different, that he was set apart. You know, he probably had some wild, crazy hair and he just embraced it. He decided to throw on a camel hair, you know, shirt and a leather belt and was just like, this is my look, y'all. You don't have to like it, but this is me. That's the kind of person John the Baptist was. And I love this because as we think about John the Baptist, I want us to kind of get a time frame. So where we left off last Sunday, we, were, we, we told the story and preached on the message about how Jesus was left in the temple by his parents. And they, for three days, they were searching for him, couldn't find him. They came back to, he was 12 years old, right? They came back to the temple. And, and when we left off, we were told that Jesus grew in favor or in stature uh, in wisdom, stature, favor with man, favor with God, right? So he continued to grow. But we also hear from Luke in Luke 180 that his cousin John also continued to grow strong in the spirit. He grew strong in the spirit and he was, he was out in the wilderness. He was out in the desert. Even as a little boy, he just spent all his time out in the desert. But he was growing spiritually strong. The Holy Spirit had been given to him before birth because he was the one that would take on the spirit of Elijah and prepare the way of the coming Messiah, who was his cousin, Jesus. And so John is growing. Jesus is growing. Uh, he, he is, we're 18 years removed. I know we're only one Sunday removed from that story. But in Luke's gospel, this is 18 years later. So there's been 18 years elapsed between the story that we told last Sunday and the story that we're going to look at today. Did you know that Luke begins his gospel, and we didn't go there, because remember I told you we're going to kind of do the Christmas stuff at Christmas season, but Luke begins his gospel uh, looking at the birth of John, and I want to read some of that to you this morning. Let's look first at Luke 1, 5 through verse 17, and this is going to give us a lot of background on John the Baptist. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Now, we know this is not something that stops God. 
We've seen in scripture earlier in the Old Testament that God could bless Abraham and Sarah in their old age with a child. He does the same here in the New Testament as he blesses Zachariah and Elizabeth with a child, even though they were well advanced in years. Verse 8, so it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. This is the Nazarite vow being proclaimed over him by the angel. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. When we get to the Christmas portion of this story, you're going to find that when Jesus shows up in the womb of Mary, that John the Baptist, who at the time is in the womb of, of Anna or Elizabeth, I'm sorry, he's in the womb of Elizabeth, when he senses the presence of Jesus because this little baby's filled with the Holy Spirit even though he's in the womb of his mother Elizabeth he jumps in the womb for joy because he knows that the one he's born to proclaim has shown up and is in his presence so the Holy Spirit is in this little child uh, it says it says that uh, verse verse uh, 16 and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord so here is here is John and his birth and why he is coming and what he's going to accomplish with his life. He's a special child that's been given to a special couple that was well advanced in years. He has a, a miracle birth. He's been blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit, even in his mother's womb. And his, his purpose is to make a people ready for the coming Messiah. He's going to prepare the way. And God is going to give him the spirit that was in Elijah that Elisha got a double portion of. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Elijah prepared the way for Elisha, who had a double portion of the spirit that was within him. John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus, who has a much greater portion of the spirit because he is one with the spirit in the Godhead uh, that is coming after him. And so we see God doing an amazing thing here. Then after little John is born, uh, John the ba or John's father, Zacharias, has a, um, a prophecy. And I want you to see his prophecy because within John, John's father, Zacharias's prophecy, we see the purpose statement for John's life. And it's found in verses 76 through 79 of chapter one of the book of Luke. Here's what it says. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. Now understand this, there hadn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years. And yet he's saying to John, you're going to be the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the mission, the purpose for John coming here to proclaim the fact that Messiah was coming behind him. He is preparing the way of Messiah. In our passage here, we know that Luke is writing to his friend Theophilus. We talked about that in our, in our introduction. So Luke wanted his friend Theophilus to remember how spiritually dark the world was before the appearance of John the Baptist. He's setting the scene for us here. He's He's trying to tell Theophilus, I want you to understand how bad things were when John the Baptist showed up. And so the way he describes that is the beginning portion of chapter 3. And I want to read that to you, John chapter 3. Listen, listen to verses 1 and 2, and he's kind of setting the table to say, remember how bad things were during that time? He said, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iturea, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while 
uh, Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So here's what, here's what Luke is doing. He is letting Theophilus know how bad things were when, Luke, when John the Baptist showed up. And I don't think you could assemble a more uh, wicked company of scoundrels than what Luke describes here in the beginning of chapter 3. He's saying, listen, Tiberius was in charge. Now, Tiberius was an emperor who thought he was a god. He was a twisted man. He was known uh, for his brutality. He was known for oppressing other countries, for coming in and possessing things that were not his and just claiming them for the Roman Empire. And so he is known for being a wicked and corrupt leader. So he's saying, remember the day when Tiberius was Caesar? Pontius Pilate was very feared he was someone who was governor over that area. He was extremely feared. He was someone that, that uh, all the people would hear his name and they would be like, oh, Pontius Pilate. He was such a, 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 he was such a difficult person to, to live under. And then he says, he says uh, Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee. We all know Herod was kind of crazy. Um, he was somebody that uh, is later going to kill John as a result of, of being offended by the things that John preached about him. He's someone that tried to kill Jesus. He, he's, he's, he's a messed up guy. His brother Philip, who's Tetrarch of Israel, is, is way out there as well. Th then we get down into the priest, and, and Annas and Caiaphas were also some guys who were, who were uh, kind of crazy. As a matter of fact, Ananias' legacy was that he controlled the high priest office for three decades, which was forbidden. And the way that he, he controlled that office was that he, he placed in hierarchy and in authority his sons and sons-in-law so that he could continue to pull the strings from behind the green curtain, if you will. So he stayed in control even though other people had the office. That's why when Luke writes this, he names two high priests. You can't have two high priests at the same time. But do you notice he names two high priests here? He says Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Well, really, Caiaphas was a high priest, but Caiaphas was the son-in-law to Annas or Ananias. Uh, that he's, he's referred to that way in other Gospels. He's the son-in-law. But Caiaphas is the high priest, but yet Luke says Ananias and Caiaphas were high priests. Why? Because Ananias had already, he had already come to the end of his term of being high priest, but he con continued to control the office through his son-in-law, and so Luke doesn't pull any punches. He's like, yeah, he was the high priest too because he was actually the one uh, making all the decisions. So what he's saying is it's against this backdrop of political and religious darkness that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He say, what does that have to do with me today? Well, I don't know. There's a lot of darkness out there today. There's a lot of wickedness out there today. There's a lot of people today who, who are um, there's a lot of there's a lot of people today who are actually <laughs> I think every time I talk she screams. <laughs> this must be my voice. To some, every time I talk you sleep. I don't know which is worse. Um, but John, is, John is, is, is coming to serve in this backdrop of political unrest, of, 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 of wickedness, but yet he still shines brightly in the midst of this incredible darkness, which reminds all of us, the darker the environment, the brighter the light. Amen? Amen. We can't be afraid of who rises in leadership or we can't be afraid of who has authority over us because the word of God tells us that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. We can still go about building a kingdom that is not of this world, even though the kingdoms of this world are corrupt and wrong and going in the wrong direction. It really doesn't matter for us because we serve a higher power than the president of the United States or whoever sits in authority over us because even the heart of that person is in the hand of the Lord. Amen. Jesus reigns no matter what. And so we need to always remember that we can't be hampered by who's in leadership over us we can go about doing the work of the kingdom, the bigger kingdom than the one we live in here on earth. I think it's interesting as we look at John the Baptist that we realize as, as a son of a legitimate priestly family, John could have served in the temple 
dressed in the finest clothes. He could have eaten from the best of meats and bread and sacrifices. Even the government, even the Roman government allowed the priesthood to get the 10% from all of the other tribes that they were supposed to get. So in the midst of all the poverty and all of the issues that the typical Jewish family was facing, the priests still had it pretty good, even in Roman oppression, because they still were able to get the 10%. If you remember back when all of the lands were given to each tribe, the, the tribe of Levi wasn't given land because they were told to be in every land to serve as priests to all the tribes, and then the tribes would give their 10%, and as a result of getting their 10%, the priests could live on that and could be sustained and could go about the work of the ministry. And so John could have lived in comfort. He could have had all the best of everything. He could have wore nice clothes and eaten good food, but John didn't. John chose to follow the plan of God for his life, and he passed on all of that. It's interesting that he is the first legitimate prophet in 400 years. Israel has not heard from a prophet of God for 400 years. And John shows up as God's messenger. But this message is not a friendly message. When John shows up, he delivers a message of judgment. His message is one that the Messiah is coming, but the Messiah is one that you need to be prepared for. There needs to be repentance before he gets here. And so I want you to first notice in verses 3 through 6 the purpose of John's message. Let's read, these, let's read these verses together. Verse three, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John came bearing the message of repentance. The word repent today carries a lot of baggage. The Hebrew and Greek behind the English word means turn back, change, and turn around. They imply an understanding that the simple act of turning is reflective of a change of heart and mind. Repentance prepares the way for Jesus to come into our hearts say, what do you mean by that? Well, you see, the Bible says in Hebrews, he who comes to God must believe that he is God. If we have unrepentant sin in our heart, we are declaring that we are God. Because what we want is our sin, our, our, our selfishness. We want to come first more than anything else. And God says, wait a minute. I can't come into your heart. I can't come into your life. If you want sin to reign in your life, then I can't reign in your life. You have to clear space out for me to sit on the throne of your life. And in order for you to do that, you have to turn your back on those things in order for me to become God. And so John the Baptist is saying that if you want Jesus to lead you, you can't allow sin to be the leader of your life. If you want Jesus to rule you, you can't allow Sin to be the ruler of your life. You have to make way for the Messiah. A unique feature of John's ministry was his baptism. Now, I want you to know that baptism was nothing new to the people of Israel. It wasn't new, but it was new for the Jew. You see, the Pharisees and the Essenes would baptize Gentile converts into Judaism. And it was the act of washing them clean from the other pagan things that they had in their life. And so he would, he would be baptized, that, that convert would be baptized to wash them clean so that they could walk in this new way of living. And so um, John said, I'm not just going to baptize Gentiles so that they could be made clean for this new way of living. We're going to baptize Jews as well so that the Jews can be made clean for this new way of living under rule of the Messiah who is coming. And so the Jews didn't know quite how to take this. Like, Wait a minute, this guy's out in the wilderness baptizing Jews. We don't baptize Jews, we baptize Gentiles. Jews are already clean because they're sons of Abraham. They don't have any need to be baptized. 
But John says, turn back to God and be baptized. Then your sins will be forgiven. Now, this does not mean that baptism brings forgiveness of sins. In fact, John's baptism followed each person's repentance and was a sign of a repented heart. John applied the pressure to the people to take an honest look at themselves and then to change. And he brought this message to every person. didn't matter who you are. If you were rich or poor, if you were young or you were old, if you were a person of esteem or you were someone who was despised and rejected, John brought it to every person. The priest, the soldier, that didn't matter. John was full of the Spirit. And his preaching had such an effect on the multitudes that they came out in droves and they fell under convict, conviction uh, as a result of, of asking for their sins to be forgiven and then they would follow in baptism. Entering the waters of the Jordan physically demonstrated the person's spiritual willingness to have the Messiah forgive his sins. You'll notice in this passage that there's a quote from Isaiah where it says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. When this verse is read, people's minds would always go to the preparedness that took place before royalty would come into their region. You would prepare the places where royalty, if a, if a king or a governor or, or a prince or someone that, that had great authority, maybe even a global leader, if they were to come into your region, you would go before them and you would find out what roads they would be entering in and you would fill in all of the potholes and all of the curves that went around something. It would be cut down and the path would be made straight so that this person could enter that city in comfort. And when John talks about this, their minds immediately turn to the idea that we've got to make these paths straight because Messiah is coming. But John is saying this has nothing to do with the physical walkways of our region. This has everything to do with the condition of your heart being ready for Messiah to come and for you to give him his proper place as king over your life. And so John the Baptist is proclaiming that they all needed to get ready because they all needed the coming Messiah. At this point, he didn't give a name. He's preaching about the one that's been prophesied of. What we know is he was talking about Jesus. And what John was saying is, you need to prepare yourself because you need Jesus. So not long ago, my wife showed up with a shirt that said, y'all need Jesus on it. I think she got it at Walmart. It said, y'all need Jesus. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know if you should wear that shirt because it seems, it almost seems like it's a, a little like, um, I don't know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Judgmental maybe or whatever. I'm like, I don't know if I like that or not. You know, it almost seems like y'all need Jesus. I don't need Jesus. I, you know, it's, so I was like, I don't know if I love that shirt. But I will say this. The shirt tells the truth. Y'all need Jesus. And guess what? I need Jesus too. I identify so much with the author of the old song where he said, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need Jesus. Listen, let me tell you something about John. Here's what I love about John. His purpose was to tell the world they need Jesus. And can I tell you something today? Our purpose as believers and followers of Jesus Christ is to tell the world the same. To not shy away from it. Listen, we are so worried that we're going to get in a difficult conversation or that we might offend someone by bringing up something in conversation. If you can be friendly and kind to people, not judgmental, but just someone who understands where they are in life and the struggles that they're facing and then present to them the one and only cure for all things. And it all comes in the name of that name that we, in the power of that name that we sang about this morning, that name Jesus. Wouldn't it be ridiculous for us if we had sick people around us who were dying with cancer and we said, oh, I feel so sorry for those people. I, 
I wish they could, I wish they could be cured from that. I wish there was a way, but I don't want to walk in there and make them think that I know everything and they don't know everything. I don't want them to think that I got everything they need and they don't have it. I'm so worried that I'm going to offend them. And so you take the cure to cancer that you're carrying in your pocket and you walk right, right past them because you're worried that they're going to be offended by the fact that you're bringing them a cure for what ails them. You say that's absolutely ridiculous, Pastor Frank. Who would do that? So if Vaughn was struggling with cancer and I, I was so scared to act like I had something that he needed or to act like I, I, I might be a little further, uh, whatever it is, I'm so scared of offending him that I have something he needs that I just walk right past him. I allow him to live in that condition for the rest of the short days that he has ahead of him. When I have the cure in my pocket, I could go up and say, Vaughn, I, don't want, you to, I want you to understand, so I don't think I'm a know-it-all, brother. I don't, I don't want you, the reason that I have this, because I once had what you have, and, and someone presented this to me, and it, it cured me of this, and, and, and brother, I want you to know that, that I don't think I'm better than you or smarter than you or anything like that, but I do know this, that what I have here will cure what you're dealing with. We're so scared to death to share the truth with people. I love that John says, my whole purpose for being here is to let you know that you need Jesus and he's coming and you can partake of what he has to offer, this free gift of salvation by the sacrifice that he's going to make. So I, I want you to see here, first of all, the, the, the purpose of John's message. But I also want you to see the problem with John's message. If you look at verses 7 through 11, it says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the ax is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people ask him saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. See, the problem with repentance is that it's very difficult for us to tell if someone is truly repentant. So John the Baptist taught the people that they must bear fruit worthy of repentance. Here's what he's saying. Talk is cheap. Here's what he's saying. This idea that you're going to show up and get baptized just in case what I'm saying is right. You don't have any intention of changing your life. There's no transformation that's taking place. You're just showing up to get some fire insurance policy. It's not going to work for you. Because this repentance that takes place and this Messiah that's going to come, he's going to bring transformation to your life. I want you to show me fruit worthy of repentance. I want to see life change. I want to see transformation. Don't tell me how much you've repented and you walk away from here after being dipped in this water and you act exactly the way you did before you showed up. You know what he says to them? If you were to take the, the real literal translation of what John is saying, he's saying that some of you guys are like vipers who come squirming out of the fire. And you're just trying to escape the fire. You're trying to, to run out from something that is harmful, but you have no intention at all of changing your ways. He says you, you're, you're fleeing from the fire, a brush fire, trying to escape. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. What was he saying? He warned them to flee from the wrath to come. He said, now bear fruits worthy of repentance. And John says, you guys have confidence in a baptism or you have confidence in your heritage that you're sons of Abraham. But I'm here to tell you right now that God could raise up from these stone sons of Abraham. And he says, I want you to know the axe is being sharpened right now to cut away the root of those who will not accept the Messiah, the son of God who comes down from this father who gave us the commandment and gave us the law and gave us the covenant. It is his son that's coming. And those, even the Jews who reject it, the ax will be brought down and cut them away from the tree. The root will be severed. Why? Because it's all about a heart condition. It's not about how you were born or what heritage you have. So John destroyed their sense of false confidence like some religious but lost people today. 
Many of the Jews thought that they were destined for heaven simply because they were descendants of Abraham. And John said that, tr- that teaching is not true. He says, he says just because you were born into Judaism doesn't mean that you're going to be saved, doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, redeemed. So John says, listen, I want to see fruits of repentance. This, this teaching shocked the people. And according to verse 10, the people were asking John, what shall we do then? And John's answer is a little bit surprising. He didn't give them religious things to do. He didn't say, go say 10 Hail Marys and eight Hail Our Fathers. He didn't say, go show up to some Protestant church and, and repeat the Apostles' Creed. He didn't say, man, go, go to your church and, and get on your hands and knees before God and crawl up and down the aisles praying for God to forgive you of all the awful things that you've done. He didn't say that at all. He surprised them with some really, um, really practical things that we kind of wonder, what is, what is John saying here? John says to the people, he says, if you've got two coats and there's someone who's cold out there and doesn't have one, why don't you give one to somebody who's cold instead of keeping two for yourself? He says, if you have food and plenty of it, why don't you give it to someone who's, who's starving? To the tax collectors who were notorious for overcharging the people, he said in verse 13, collect no more than what is appointed for you. It's interesting. John tells the soldiers, he says, all I need you to do is quit being unfair to people. I need you to, I, I need you to quit falsely accusing people because you have the right to do that and you don't like them. And so you falsely accuse them. He tells the tax collectors, don't overcharge people so you can live a, a, a more cushy life even though you've, you've caused other people to die of hunger. John was pointing out that if repentance is genuine, then it will impact the way we live our daily lives. He was saying it might begin with a sorrowful heart. So repentance might begin with a heart that is sorry, but it will always end with determined action. There will be a difference because we act differently. Repentance was a way of life, not just a one-time event. The fruits of repentance were not an effort to earn being rescued from our sins, but rather a concrete practical evidence that a life had been touched and moved by God's mercy. Now, before you get too far in the wrong direction and say, oh, this is works-based salvation, understand this was before the cross of Jesus Christ. This was a prophet making the path clear for Jesus to come. This was someone saying that in order for you to be prepared to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have got to make space for him in your heart. You can't embrace your sin and embrace Jesus at the same time. So he's preparing the way. We still know the truth of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that says that we're saved by grace. So what is John's message? It's one that says, hey, there's a problem in my message, and that is this. Some of you want to come and get some kind of false confidence that you're going to be okay, and here's the thing. I'm not looking for you to make some kind of act uh, of of baptism to indicate that you're going to make room for the Savior. I'm not asking you to say you got it all covered because you're a child of Abraham. I am telling you that if you truly have repented, your life will prove it. If you truly have repented, your actions will declare it. It won't be just, it won't be just a symbol of baptism. So we see the, the, the problem in John's message. And last, I want you to see the pain in John's message. As we read verses 19 and 20, look what happens. It says, um, but Herod, the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this above all, that he shut John up in prison. So the story behind these verses is a pretty tangled mess of a story. Herod Antipas has several half-brothers, and one of them is Philip, the Tetrarch of Icheria. Philip is married to a woman named Herodias, who's the daughter of one of the other half-brothers. I know, don't, don't try to get too deep into this. 
Antipas became attracted, infatuated with Herodias. Now, Herodias is a pretty ambitious woman. She knows that, that uh, Herod, Antipas, is a pretty um, powerful guy. He's an incredibly wealthy guy. And so Herodias says, listen, I'll, I'll agree to divorce my husband and marry you instead if you agree to divorce your wife and get her out of the way. And so he divorces his wife, takes his brother's wife, and after divorcing and disgracing his wife, um, Antipas finally got his, this object of his affection, of his lust, this woman named Herodias. So everybody knew what had happened, right? Everybody knew that, that Herod had, had taken his brother's wife, just a, a power move, just, hey, she's your wife, but I want her and I'm going to take her. And there's nothing you can do about it because she's going to divorce you and I'm going to get rid of my wife. And so we're just going to make a bunch of moves and I'm trading my wife in for a newer model, right? So he does all of this and Israel, now this is a country that because they followed the law, they have a pretty high standard of morality. They, they understand that life is supposed to be lived a certain way and there's supposed to be some integrity especially in the lives of political leaders. So nobody, even though they know it's incredibly wrong, even though they know this is disgusting what's happened, nobody rises up and says anything about what Herod has done. Nobody will mention it. But remember when I told you that Jesus had a fearless cousin? John the Baptist says, you know what? While I'm preaching, let me just go ahead and let me just talk a little bit about what you guys have allowed to happen on your watch. He's talking to the religious leaders. He's talking to the priests and he's talking to the Pharisees. And he's saying, let me tell you, you guys have sat here and kept your mouth shut. Even though those who have ruled over you, who, have, who, who are supposed to be in charge, you have allowed them. And you have this, uh, you, you have this collaboration with them and, and, and you're one with them. And you're totally okay as long as everything can go smoothly and it doesn't hinder what you're doing. You're totally okay with Herod living the kind of wicked life that he's living. And I'm here to tell you that this is not going to be something that the Messiah is going to tolerate. And so he speaks against it. And if you know the whole story, you know eventually that Herodias' daughter danced before Herod. One day he was so infatuated by her daughter, which would be his stepdaughter, that he said, wow, you know, anything you want, I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. You're starting to get an idea of how demented Herod is and how depraved Herod is. And he says, I'll give you anything. And Herodias, who had been the object of so much of John the Baptist's preaching, saying this is wrong, this is something you shouldn't do. She says, I'll tell you what I want. I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so they behead John and they serve his head up to Herodias on a platter. Now, I saved all of that for, you know, Halloween story for you guys here at church. <laughs> so John the Baptist loses his life because he spoke the truth. But I want you to notice here that all this pain in being a messenger, it... it, it it comes because John is willing to step up and speak the truth. He's not scared to tell the truth. And by the way, we've heard a lot about weaponizing the Department of Justice. If you've ever seen a story where the Department of Justice was weaponized towards someone who was willing to step up and speak the truth about something that was going on, you're seeing it in this story. So John the Baptist is beheaded. He loses his life. Because he, he spoke the truth. He wasn't scared. He was a fearless prophet. He wasn't the first prophet to lose his life because he spoke out against a, a queen. As a matter of fact, his predecessor in whose spirit he lived, uh, Elijah, uh, almost lost his life for doing that, uh, rising up against the queen. But God took him out uh, in a chariot of fire before that could happen. So... We see John the Baptist is not afraid to speak the truth. He's not afraid to step up in the face of, a, of, of a, a nation that would try to protect wickedness. And he, he speaks the truth. So we see the, the, 
the purpose of John's message, the, the problem of John's message, and the pain of John's message. Let's look at the rest of the story and look at the passion of John's message. Verse 21, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. We see here John gets the um, privilege of baptizing Jesus. Jesus shows up while John is baptizing. This, now remember, this is a baptism of repentance. You say, wait a minute, John, John is baptizing Jesus. Shouldn't Jesus be baptizing John? I mean, John, with all the good that he does, he's still a sinner. But Jesus, born of the Spirit, is not a sinner. So shouldn't it be the other way around? And I want you to see, just so we're clear on all this, uh, Luke doesn't tell this story, but Matthew tells the rest of the story. Matthew chapter 3 and verses 13 through 15. We have that available. We have that ready. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. So what was Jesus saying? John said, I should be, you should be baptizing me. I'm the one that needs to be baptized. I'm the one that has sin that needs to be forgiven. You're sinless. And Jesus said, no, no, this needs to fulfill all righteousness. What is Jesus saying? Jesus says that what's happening is this is the beginning of my earthly ministry, but at the end of it, I am going to take on all the sin. I'm going to be the one who stands uh, under the sin of humanity. I'm going to take the punishment from God, the wrath of God. And this is a, a prophecy of what I'm going to do because I'm going to become sin for the people. It's best described in 2 Corinthians chapter, um, chapter 5 and verse 21. Look at this verse. It says, for he made him, that's God, God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You say, what does that mean? That means that Jesus took all of our sin, he became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. Now, how does that happen? That happens when we accept the free gift of the shed blood of Jesus Christ as a propitiation for our sin. In other words, this is the payment for the sin that we've committed. Jesus took that punishment for us, and because he has taken our sin, he allows us to be clothed in his righteousness. So now I am in good standing with God because I'm no longer seen by God as a sinner. I am now seen by someone who is clean by the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I know, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, man, you guys, you Christians are always talking about the blood and the blood and the blood and the blood. If you really understand the past, if you understand why the blood's so important, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to hit you so hard. So back in the old days, the only way sins could be atoned for was a yearly sacrifice of animals. And that, that animal would pay the price of the sins of that family. And that sacrifice would be made, the blood would be shed, and as a result of that blood, that family's sins would be forgiven for that year. Jesus came and took all the sins of humanity. He became the once-for-all sacrifice. And so his blood is important because the blood that was shed by Jesus covers the sins of all of humanity. So when you say, you guys are bloody people or whatever, I know sometimes people feel like that. The idea is that we celebrate the blood of Jesus because it was what forgave us of our sins. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sins. And so we have to celebrate that once for all sacrifice the way the Jews used to celebrate that yearly sacrifice. We celebrate the once for all sacrifice for humanity. And that was when Jesus became sin for us so that we could be righteousness to God. Does that make sense? Everybody get that? So if you're new to all this and you say, we all talk about blood a lot. It's because we have to celebrate the sacrifice that was made so that we could be righteousness before God. Amen? All right. So what is the passion of John's ministry? Well, he baptizes Jesus. And when he baptizes Jesus, a voice from heaven comes out and says, You, pointing at Jesus, you, Jesus, are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, if you're wondering why this has significance, it's because some of John's, some of John's followers were wondering if John was the Messiah. Some of the people was wondering, were wondering if, if John was the Messiah. 
And God shows up on the scene at Jesus' baptism and makes it very clear. He points at Jesus and says, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And you would think with all that John had done that John might be offended. Like, well, where's my, where's my credit? Where's, you know, why, why am I not getting a, a pat on the back? But John doesn't take that, that approach at all. As a matter of fact, in, in John chapter 3 and verse 30, John the Baptist says this, he must increase and I must decrease. What he's saying is, I'm here, and this is, this is my last point. I want you to get this. John's whole existence revolved around making Jesus known for who he was, which was the once for all sacrifice for all of humanity. John's entire existence was about Jesus being known to the Jew first and then to the Greek and then all over the world as the one who could forgive humanity for their sins. And John says, if that means that I must decrease, I'm totally okay with that. Because my whole existence revolves around the fact that I want the world to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can be made right with the Father except by this one that I'm baptizing today, the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His whole life revolved around that message. Now, do I even have to preach that point or do we already get it? You see, not only did John prepare the way for the Messiah, but he also became an example for those of us who would live under the name of the Messiah for the rest of the existence of humanity on earth. And that is that we too are supposed to live our lives for the purpose of letting the world around us know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to him, and you can't get forgiveness from your sins, and you can't be made right with the Father without the sacrificial blood of the spotless lamb that is Jesus. And so I want you to know with my life, my actions, the things that I do, the words that I speak, the compassion that I show, I want you to feel that this is all to point you in one direction. Sometimes I get so frustrated by churches who want to post every little thing that they do, every compassionate thing that they do. They want to call the news crews out. I saw this one church who did this big Christmas thing where they brought in all these toys that their church gathered and they had this store where underprivileged people could come in and give those toys to these families. And this church calls the news crew in and says, y'all come film this, film all these families that are underprivileged, show them, show everybody that they're having to come in and get free toys for their kids because they can't afford their own. And I'm going, what are you thinking, man? This is not about you and your church. This is about showing the love of Jesus to these people who sometimes are rejected and despised. Sometimes they're, they're on the margins of society. It's not about the news knowing that you're doing something great. It's about you being the hands and feet of Jesus. What does that say? It says that you're doing what you're doing for the praise of men. John the Baptist could have gotten all the praise of men that he wanted because of who he was and the message that he spoke, but all he wanted to do was decrease so God could increase. See, I'm not here to impress a bunch of people of how good I am or, or how, how, how much compassion I show. or, or it's, it's not that. If you're doing it for that reason, you need to just stop because you're wasting your time. The, the Bible says you're going to get your reward right here on earth. But if you're doing it to make Jesus look great, if you're doing it because you want that lost person or those underprivileged people or those marginalized people to recognize that they have a Savior that loves them right where they are, and you're not letting your right hand know what your left hand's doing, then the Bible says your reward in heaven is great. See, John wasn't trying to increase. He was trying to decrease so that Jesus could be pushed up. Amen. That's the way we're to live our lives. So don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. Don't post about every good thing you do. For heaven's sake, I'm so sick of seeing it. Like every time I look at it, I want to tell Christians, do you realize you just forfeited your reward in heaven? Do you realize by posting all the wonderful things that you just did, that you just told the world how great you are, and now Jesus gets nothing from it? We must decrease. 
if we want him to increase. John says, that's my whole life is about that. I'm, I'm fearless in the wake of it. You can take my head. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm here to make him increase. And I'll decrease however he feels that it needs to happen. That's the life that we're all supposed to be living. John was an incredible example of it. I'm here to prepare the way of the Messiah. Not to try to be the Messiah, but to prepare the way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this incredible example of this man of God who taught us how to speak well, speak the truth fearlessly, but in love, even to the despised and rejected, these Roman soldiers, these Jewish soldiers that are coming to be baptized, these tax collectors that everyone else wants to push away. John says, bring them, bring them. Let them show fruits of their repentance by not overcharging people or not oppressing people. Let them show that they're different by what they found in the Messiah that's coming. And God, may we be different because we have found the Messiah who came. May our lives point others to Jesus alone. And may we do what we do so that Jesus can increase even if it means that we need to decrease. So have your way in our hearts as we give ourselves unconditionally to you and help us, Father, to do not only right and good, but to do it for the right and good reason. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.